I am Elias Barenboim. Uh, this is a joint tutorial with Drago Pleco. We'll be talking about the causal fairness analysis. Um, the, this is my Twitter. If you want to talk with me, I usually there. Uh, drop me a line uh, to discuss about fairness, causality, AI, and machine learning. Um, the references here, if you want to download uh, the, the first one that we just po posted online, uh, and you make a kind of more refined website, but this is the uh, fairness.causalai.net that has these slides that I'm using now. Um, there is a companion paper that we just also uploaded uh, if you want to check the details and the examples and so on. Uh, this is uh, Drago and I in the causal fairness analysis. This is a technical report, R90, um, r90.pdf, you can find in the, my group's website. Um, five seconds or 10 if you want to download the, the slides. I will start slow. Um, and I think most of you probably there in this room, I uh, think the question is like, why, what are the fairness challenges uh, in AI? And fairness, I'm using kind of umbrella terms for uh, fairness, transparency, accountability, and so. Um, this is the classic case, now classic today, on the machine bias uh, setting in which there is a machine learning setting, a system there that is trying to do, I think in Florida, trying to do predictions about the probability of someone uh, committing the crime again, they call recidivism. And, uh, and the analysis, uh, uh, and, and this is used related to deciding if you allow people bail or not. Uh, and the analysis seems to suggest that there is a discrimination against the minority group in this case would be the uh, African-American community. Um, the, that's one. Uh, and I was kind of just Googling at random and trying to get uh, what's going on. This is a, a, another uh, at random kind of uh, link that you say the Amazon scrap secret AI recruiting tool that showed bias against women. Um, and then we can kind of, this is the open AI uh, kind of playground uh, that you have the two Muslim walk into coffee and then they, they continue with the sentence and it, it ends up being kind of the, the, co the coffee shop blows up. Um, and you can go on and on here and it's all over the place that there is some type of tension and, uh, uh, and challenges. About, this is about Google, Twitter, Facebook, and Apple slapped with the class action lawsuit uh, related to the conservative censorship. Um, again, and it's all over the place that there is something in the air and in some way you have issues of, of, of fairness and discriminations and lack of transparency in these systems uh, and in decision-making systems more broadly that once were made by humans, now you are kind of transferring the control and you are just in the beginning, the next five, 10, 20 years, this will just accelerate. You are transferring the control of these systems to uh, these decisions to the systems. And the, que the question is like uh, how to try to keep them uh, or to, to make them fair because they were not in the beginning, in the first place. Um, a key observation here, and I think we developed is the, in, in some way these systems are fueled or based on data and data is nothing more than a picture of what's going on in the reality that we're trying to make a, a decision, make a statement about. But if this current reality is messed up and you get this snapshot that is the data, what are the expectations? Here are the expectations of the system that is oblivious to causality and fairness will essentially replicate uh, this, type of, this type of unfairness in the real world. Um, some people take this as a prelude or some kind of indication that we should kind of not use AI or not use ML, uh, given that uh, it could, could be quite bad, not on the replication or even the amplification of these biases, uh, we take a more positive stance, given that it's inevitable. And you are in the area, we would like to understand uh, what is really going on there. Uh, and also take as opportunity. It's quite hard to change human beings. Many of these biases are, are even the subconscious level and, uh, and the AI is kind of agnostic to that. Then if, proper, if properly uh, retooled, this could be a, 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 a positive kind of posi possibility here of saving or, or, or improving reality for so many. The challenge, by, the challenge is that the, the data is no longer kind of the oracle. Having more data uh, as throughout AI and ML, you have this almost like axiomatic approach that if you give me more data, eventually will converge. I can have more, more clever algorithms and we'll be able to capture something that we want from the underlying truth. It's just about kind of dancing around the data uh, and, and trying to process this better. The here is not the case because data is the picture of reality that is messed up. 
then we are trying to talk about alternative reality uh, that it doesn't exist yet. Then we need some kind of proper tools and proper language to talk about this alternative uh, uh, that is kind of unprecedented in the problem that we saw before. Um, anyhow, the one, one valid question <clears throat> that you usually get uh, is like, why, why causality matters for fair AI? As I just said, the problem happens also in the real world. In the real world, we usually we have settings, uh, uh, this is judged by uh, the legal system. Uh, those are decisions by the, I will just, some quotes from decisions from the Supreme Court that says that uh, in 2008, they start to establish a disparate treatment claim under this plain language. A plaintiff must prove the but for cause of the employer's adverse uh, decision. A plaintiff must prove the, by a preponderance of evidence, which may be direct or circumstantial, the age was the but for cause of the challenge employer uh, decision. Now, this is uh, for a subsequent uh, decision in 15, saying a disparate impact claim. I'll try to specify what this means more formally, but a disparate impact claim relying on statistical disparity must fail uh, if the plaintiff cannot point to a defendant's policy or policies uh, causing that disparity. And then you have, I will not fully read here, but trying to demonstrate a causal connection or cannot show a causal connection. Then it's all over the law and all over the language in these cases that are happening in the real world that you need to show some type of causal link in order to, to demonstrate a cause of the uh, case of discrimination. <clears throat> then the, the outline, without further ado, I think I, the outline of the talk um, the, the, it goes as follows. Uh, I will start reviewing uh, basic causal concepts and I'll try to do that in the context of Fairland's analysis. analysis. Then I'll introduce, maybe spend, I don't know, 20 minutes around uh, discussing these concepts. Uh, then I introduce the foundations of fairness analysis based on CI, causal inference, including what we call the theory of decomposing variations, different types of causal measures, and also what we call the fairness map. It's some kind of summary of the results. Then we discuss connections with the previous literature or some of the other previous literature. Hopefully it'll be clear. Then we just, and then we go kind of more practical and show how causal fairness, how fairness analysis based on causality can be used to to the task of bias detection and bias uh, quantification. And then we discuss uh, the second task, discuss the implications of fairness analysis based on causality to the task of prediction, fair prediction. Um, in, in some way, this is a partition kind of the talk, the first one, two, possibly three will be part one, and then you move for, for part two. The, the first part will be, stay here, you don't abandon me or us, but it will be more abstract and theoretical. The second part will try to ground, have a little bit more of data. It will, it will be formal as well, but it will be more applied in some way. Um, the, now, again, the structure, what is the big picture that we discuss? Start, I would like you to have this picture that I will create here in mind that will go over it during the tutorial. Uh, to ground the discussion, we will have the, some kind of model of the, the decision process but the data generating model will be based on something called structural causal model. It's a collection of mechanisms that it is the unobserved reality. We don't get it, but there is some type of mechanism that are going on in the minds of the people when they decide which university to apply or the, the, the decision maker, which kind of, if they give the loan or don't give it lo the loan and so on. Then we will model the reality to a collection of causal mechanisms that we call SCM M star. Uh, we usually will sample data and get data from this reality, uh, and then we have a, a, a data set D from the past decisions. We can also do modeling, given that this reality is hard to get, we'll do something called causal modeling based on some knowledge, hopefully not too strong, and this gives rise to something called the causal diagram. And I'll define all these blocks here formally. And then we have something called the structural measures. Um, I will talk about that. Um, now we get something that is defined on top of reality. The measures and define the, measure, the, the fairness measures that will be coming from the doctrines and social norms that we have in society. There are different ones that I will specify. One is called disparate treatment and the other the disparate impact. Uh, and then we will we'll try to carve some space, something very important in practice, or at least in the legal practice, called business necessity. Then we, we will kind of bind in these measures, the green with the pink, we have the empirical measures, fairness. 
Um, this guy here in the middle, the structural mesh, as far as this is the backbone and the kind of very unique for the fairness analysis. The other components are kind of causal. Um, as the output of this pipeline or this backbone, now we can try in the second part to solve the proper tasks. We don't need more foundation can be practical. Then the first task that we consider, as I mentioned before, is the bias detection and quantification. The second task, task is a fair, a fair prediction. And the third task is a, a fair decision making. Okay, that, that, that's the, the picture that we have. I, sometimes I add boxes like that just to indicate in the companion paper where you are. It'd be helpful. In the examples, I think it's more helpful than this. Now, without further ado, let me do the causal inference review. We'll take a process-based approach to causality or define something called the structural causal model. A structural causal model is a tuple with four components, V, U, F, and P of U. We'll go over each one individually. The V is the set of uh, uh, endogenous variables or observed variables, V1, V2, Vn. We have a set of variables uh, U uh, that are exogenous, uh, unobserved, or latent. Then there's a whole world with many, many variables we partition in the set of the ones that you can measure, observe, sample, and get their values, and all other variables are left as unobserved or as exogenous, that they are outside our model, exo from outside. Now we have a collection of functions, f, uh, for each of the endogenous variables. We have n there, then we have uh, n mechanisms, f1, f2, fn. Um, the, the, for, each, for each vi in v, in the endogenous set, we have this function fi that takes as I input two qualitatively different types of input. The first one is a set of, uh, we call the parent set, pai, that is a subset of v. There's a typo here, but subset of v. Um, and the other is the UI that is the unobserved parents that is generating external variations for the variable uh, VI. Uh, so far, the first three is kind of described almost like physics, is deterministic. We know that there is uncertainty and variability in the world. We kind of spread probability mass and there is uncertainty about the units. Then you have the P of U, a probability distribution over the exogenous, the, the, the external conditions. Systems like that uh, admit uh, 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 axiomatic characterization. Those are some of the results by Gallus and Pro and by Howard. So two separate papers <clears throat> in uh, 98. Uh, there's some kind of survey with some kind of new insights on this type of systems in the Byron Boy et al. 2020. Um, <clears throat> okay, that's our system. Now, the, the, I would like to then think about the system in a slightly different way as, as we, 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 we think about in causality. And something that in this paper, in the companion paper, you call the sampling evaluation loop that goes as follows. We have two parts. You have, the, uh, you have four components in the SCM, V, U, but let's ignore the variables and focus on the, the F and the P of U. From the P of U side, the probability distribution over this, uh, the, uh, the, the variables u, you can think about this guy as the space of units. Those are the characteristics and the things that, whatever, the units that compose the population. And in the left side, we have the, the collection of mechanisms. Now, what is the sampling evaluation? First, in the space of unit, you sample and get a unit u, and let's say that this unit u is equal to u1, u2, uk. Then that's step number one, is an individual. Then we go observation. After the U is fixed, the evaluation is deterministic. Then, in other words, this U goes there and go and pass through this collection of mechanisms one by one. Someone decides to apply to college. The university decides to accept or not accept the person. The time passes and the person gets 10K more in the salary because they have the PhD or, and, and so on. Those are the, the laws of nature and the physics that you have. Um, the, that is evaluated one by one. Then I think this is a, uh, then in other words, CM, SCM can be thought of this combination of these two things. From one, one side, we have the mechanism F, on the other, we have the, the distribution of uh, U, that is the P of U. This makes up the M that we have, the data generating model. And I will repeat that a few times, and I use this picture, try to remember. Um, now, this is one of the elements. We define the data generating model. We'll give examples soon, but I would like to define now the causal diagram. This is another element here. Causal diagram is not a primitive, it's entailed by the collection of mechanisms. Every SCM M induces a causal diagram G. 
Uh, in the right side, we have the set from the SCM side. V, uh, the endogenous here is A, B, C, D, and the exogenous here is just U. And there is this collection of uh, functions there with the F of D and F of E, I just speak for two of the endogenous. Now, the, the causal diagram will be represented as a directed acyclic graph, uh, plus bidirected, I will, I will talk about them soon. Um, but the idea is like each of the endogenous variables, variable VI will be a node in this graph. And we will have, there is an arrow, an edge, V1 to VJ. Oops. Oh. There is an arrow, view, uh, got me surprised. There is an arrow, uh, VI to VJ, uh, if there is, uh, uh, if VI participates in the function of VJ. One example here for concreteness, where is my mouse here? Um, one example for concreteness, note, note here that in the function of D, in the F of D, a and B are participants. Then it means that there is an arrow A and B, one from A to D and the other from B to D. The same way in the function of E, C is a part of the observed uh, input. Then there is an arrow from C to E. That's nice. The third and last component here, that there is a bidirected arrow between VI and VJ, dashed bidirected, I would just say bidirected for, for convenience, if the sources of exogenous variations, UI and UJ, are not in, they, they are not disjoint. They're not empty in this case. Now, the, the, here, note that the U is shared. The same guy that we don't measure, this variable U, that there is the distribution P of U, this is participating in the function of the FD and FE. Then we will add a bidirected arrow between D and E. Fundamental here for causality because very common that you may leave some variables not measured uh, in general. It's hard to measure the whole thing in the world. Um, okay, this is the causal diagram. Putting that together, this gives rise to this diagram here. This is just putting all pairwise relationships together. That's the causal graph. Now I would like to define something called um, uh, the semantics for counterfactuals. <clears throat> They let X, Y uh, be subsets of V. The potential response of Y uh, uh, to action do X is equal to X, that will be denoted by this Y sub X of U, is the solution for Y of the systems of equations in M sub X, where M sub X is the same M where the equations for the variables X are replaced with the small constant X. Then um, this is the value. In other words, this is a notation. Uh, she was mentioned. Pro, Pro likes a lot this one, the, the way to because it's very compact and kind of beautiful. And this is the core one. It's, it looks deceptively, deceptively, deceptively simple. That is like this new variable that we're defined y sub x of u is defined as being the y, the solution for y in this different system m sub x, in which we replace the equation of x with small x. Uh, for the same value of u. That's the semantics uh, of this uh, quantity. And then you can define officially, uh, it's not out of the blue, uh, what's, what are called the counterfactuals. Let x and y be subsets of the endogenous v. The counterfactual sentence, the value of y would have obtained had x being small x for unit u is equal to u, is interpreted as the potential response y sub x of u. This is anyhow, the formalization. Now I'd like to ground some of these things, given that it's a, a, a little bit uh, abstract, possibly. This is a classic here. Uh, the, on the Ber Berkeley as admission, this is by Bekel et al. in 1975, a nice example. Students apply to the university admission, that is the variable Y, and choose specific departments to which they wish, uh, they wish to join. This is equal to zero for the sciences, equal to one for arts and humanities. Uh, for the purpose of discrimination monitoring, gender is also recorded, zero x is equal to zero male and one female. Now, in the, in the left side here, the, we have the, the true SCM M star. Note here that there is the, the observed variables here is x, d, and y, and there is a corresponding mechanism f of x, f of d, f of y. Uh, and in the right side, there is the, the, the causal diagram that was constructed from the guy in the left. Now, for example, just to apply the definition that we just had in the previous slide, there is an arrow, for example, from X to D, 
because X is part of the PAD, as we discussed before. There is an arrow from uh, X to Y, okay, X to Y, or D to Y, because whatever, X and D are part of the observed uh, observe, uh, uh, component here of arguments of the F sub Y, and there is also the collection of the P of U uh, there, distribution over the exogenous. Now this is the, the how they're connected. In reality, I'm talking, ab oops, I'm talking abstractly in terms of these guys, but in the real world, there is some particular function there that is instantiated. Here we are just kind of replacing the, the first, the, the, the f of x and the ux are replaced by the Bernoulli. Uh, there is, um, in this population, is half and half, uh, males and females. I should say, by the way, we are just talking males and females are partitioned just for simplicity. Uh, it makes it easier to say. Um, the, um, then there is another Bernoulli here that is 0, 5, wx here, uh, uh, um, lambda x, uh, and the lambda is instantiated. Those are the true mechanisms about how people are deciding, depending on the gender, x is 0 and 1, they, they are de deciding differently which departments to apply. And there is another function for the y here. Um, there is also a alpha here in red, it's almost like if alpha is equal to zero, it's as if this arrow here is turned off. If alpha is different than zero, it means there is some variations there about how Y is affected by the choice of gender. Then that's the connection between the SCM uh, in the left and the causal diagram in the right. Note here that the causal diagram loses a lot of information because the causal diagram has no comment or understanding about what is the distribution P of U, and there is no understanding about what is the functions that are giving values to these variables. Then it's what we call, it's a parsimonious representation of this collection of mechanisms. Not learnable, almost never, with some kind of, we can make an argument, measure theoretically that you cannot learn the guy in the left, despite its existence. Moving on here, the, this is the compass example. Uh, I'll not read here fully, but the left there is the system, in the right there is uh, the graph, where the protected attribute that you care about is the race, that is X, there is the recidivism, that is the Y prediction. Uh, there is prior convictions, that is the W. And there is also the set of covariates uh, Z, that is age. Note here that there is a different type of arrow here that is this bidirected between race and age. Again, we are trying to encode that there is some type of historical process uh, that is making these two variables to covary. We don't want, the model is not trying to explain that. Um, the, but uh, this is certainly better than removing the arrow that will be making a statement that there is an independence between race and age. But if you go to the data set and measure, this is not true. Then the arrow is giving some kind of model flexibility or kind of more leeway for accommodating this complex uh, possible historical processes. Um, the, this is another example that I, I will not just do it uh, explicitly at the moment. Maybe Drago can do it, uh, but you have in these slides. Uh, ah, I forgot to say something important here. The, just for the wheel of the, the race and age, note here that in the truth, in the mechanism in the world, they are sharing this U here. There is some U, this lambda U here and mu of U that are shared or inputs, part of the unobserved inputs of the variable X and Z, which is the one that gives rise to the bidirected arrow there. Just to ground here with the, the algebra. Um, the, that's nice. Now, the, the, we have seen a few examples. Now, uh, interestingly enough, there is some structure uh, across these examples. Um, and this gives rise to what we call uh, the standard fairness model. It's some kind of template that is trying to include these different models in a standard. We are trying to standardize that. And the standard model goes as follows. We call SFM. It goes as follows. Uh, we have the protected attribute X. The protected attribute may be affecting the outcome Y. There is possible correlation or not independence between Z and X. The guys that comes with Z is the set of covariates or features. And you have a collection of mediators, W, that are affected both by the protected attribute and attributes and the demographic variables there. The X and Z pointing to W. And this is the standard model. First appeared in this paper uh, with Jean Barenboi in, in 18. Uh, we'll kind of, at least for now, and for the tutorial, we will kind of mostly be using this uh, model, this template. Um, now I would like to introduce the um, fundamental problem of, of fairness, FPCA, FPCFA, or how, and the question in reality in human words here is how to explain the observed disparities 
found in the data in terms of the unobserved causal mechanisms. And you have disparities in the data, we would like to link that or connect that with this unobserved causal mechanism as required by the law. Um, we'll give ex another example just to try to, to ground that one. On the, on the guy on the, on the bottom, we have an observed uh, reality. On the top, we have something that's observed. These are just copying the example that we have from the Berkeley example there. Um, this is a grounded system. And if you collect data from the system that is the truth, but you don't observe, you get this data and you see the TV, the total variation, P of Y given X1 minus P of Y given X0. The variation that X1 and X0 is the gender, male and female. Uh, if you get this TV, this is equal to 14%, which means that females applicants are 14% less likely of being accepted to the university than their male counterparts. Now the question here is, is the university uh, guilty of gender discrimination? Or at least direct gender discrimination? Not about society, but the university itself. Um, I would like to, to think about this, this as the, what are the mechanisms out of these guys in the blue box here, out of this mechanism, which ones are active or not active? Note here that the, the coefficient of the variable x in the mechanism of y is equal, to, uh, have a, is equal to zero, is green here. Which means that it is not active. Despite of the possibility, the university could be looking into gender and changing the probabilities of accepting someone, at least in this reality here, they are not doing that. It's zero times x there. Then we would say in this case that the university is not doing direct discrimination. On the other hand, Note here that depending on the gender, people is applying differently for, this different, for different departments. That is the zero two here. And the university, and the university is using the department choice to change the probabilities of acceptance. There are different demands and so on, then it's not the same probability. Then in this way, there is, something, there is some kind of content that is about the gender X that is embedded in D that is then transmitted or translated to Y. Then there is some type of indirect discrimination going on there. I would, I would defer spurious for now, that is the third guy. Then in this case, if you're concerned about direct discrimination, the university is not guilty. Now it comes in the, the court, and we forget about that this is the truth. We didn't even know that. We're not the god or the designer of the system. Hard to know how people are thinking. But then come the lawyers and the, some data scientists and, uh, and say, no, in reality, I have this M star that is different than the true M, 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 M star. This is M prime. And I have this M prime, and this M prime is capable of, M prime can generate exactly the same data, 14% TV disparity. Which means that the, 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 now the question is like, is the university guilty or not? We can do the same type of analysis piece by piece. And note that in particular, in this M prime, the z, there is a 0 0.3 there in the side of X. In other words, the university is looking exactly in gender and changing the probability of accepting or not accepting the applicant. Then it's a case of direct discrimination. Uh, we can also see that there is a zero here in using the department and there is no indirect, despite the fact that people is picking departments uh, in different ways depending on the gender, the university is not deciding based on the department, at least in this particular case then there is no indirect discrimination in this case, but there is direct. Um, then in this case, if you are trying to catch or characterize the case of direct discrimination, yes, the university will be guilty of direct discrimination, where this be the truth. Now, the, in practice, in practice, we don't know anything, we don't know what is the truth, and you don't have access to the thing below, then we, that, that's what we are trying to get uh, into. How, how can you answer this type of questions? Now, I would like to, in order to do that, I would like to talk a little bit uh, about this legal uh, disparate treatment and disparate impact, that is the, the legal notions, or the, the legal doctrines. The most common legal doctrines found in the US and the, in Europe are known as the disparate treatment and the disparate impact and throughout the world in many places, mostly, uh, or at least as I understand. Disparate treatment is focused on how change is induced by the treatment or by the protected attribute X 
affects the outcome decision of variable y. In words, how the decision-making criteria changes with x. In causal inference, in CI, this is represented by the notion of some notion of direct effect that you try to be formal, and there are many, but encapsulated in the idea of direct effect. Um, on the other hand, we have di disparate impact that is related to how outcomes y behaves, and try, almost regardless of x, I'll try to make this precise, and try to understand disparities regardless of the treatment. Oh, I just said that. The, there are exceptions, it's very, it's very tricky, the disparate impact, and other central notions in legal settings include uh, what is known as the uh, business necessity. I will not talk about, uh, uh, what's the name, uh, redlining. Um, the, but it's related. Uh, in general, most of the legal discussion, as we've seen, revolve around showing specific causal links depending on what is permitted or forbidden following society standards and expectations. Um, now, I would like, to, in order to try to, to ground these doctrines, I introduce these notions in the other diagram in the backbone, in the guy in the center of the notions called structural fairness measures. Um, in order, oh, okay, in order to support a more mathematical formulation amenable, amenable to machine learning and optimization, we will like to align this with the doctrines of disparate treatment and impact. We introduce these notions. It's very simple in reality. They look not, but they are. Let the P A V I be the and A A N V I be the parents and ancestors of V I in the diagram G. For N S C M M structural model uh, M, Y is said to be fair with respect to S in terms of the direct effect. We will call this the D E fair. Um, if and only if X is not uh, 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 a part uh, element in the parent set of Y. We'll see that we'll say that y is fair with respect to x in terms of the indirect effect. We call the, we'll call this for short i.e. I e fair, if and only if x is not ancestral of the, the y. And, uh, and we'll call this the spurious effects. Uh, y is fair with respect to x in terms of the spurious effects. We'll call this s e fair, x, if and only if. Um, the observant ancestors of X and observant ancestors of Y uh, do not, do, it's empty. If you get the set of the variations, uh, variables that generate variations of X and Y go up, they are empty, then this is as if fair, and the same with the latent uh, uh, part of that. Uh, this, uh, we can we'll discuss the detail, but it's exactly the same. Um, okay, those are the notions that we use all over uh, again, the fair, IE fair, and SE fair. Um, then let's try to do that just to ground a little bit more. Structural measure represent, these structural measures represent idealized conditions in which uh, discrimination can be taught and articulated. If you go back to the legal doctrines, we can start connecting disparate treatment and impact with these measures. And let's do that. On the bottom of the slides, I'm just showing the SCM M star. Now, I'm, we are adding here, those are the structural measures, the DE fair, the IE fair, and the SE fair. They are functions of the M star. On the other side, we have what we call, uh, uh, we call composite measures. Then we have this thing called the TV fair. That is, if it's fair relative to the, the total variation. That is the Y, given x1 minus y given x0. Now, these type of variations, the TV, the variations that are in TV include the three types of variations, the direct, the indirect, and the spurious. They are all there when you measure the correlation or the TV between y, x and y, this encompasses all the paths, uh, direct, indirect, and spurious. Now, if you want to talk about disparate uh, uh, treatment, this is very related, as I said before, with the notion of DE fair or some notion of direct effect. If you want to talk about disparate impact, this is very related to the TV fair, or at least a question here is a, somewhat rhetorical, and Drago will talk more about that, I think. But um, can we use the TV fair as, as, as used in the literature as being a proxy for this notion of the, the disparate impact? In some sense, yes, but uh, it, it, it can be, we don't want to be naive about that. Um, okay. A example, uh, US government census was example number three there that I didn't talk a lot. 
But uh, the gender here was the, 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 the protected attribute. We have the outcome Y. And we have uh, uh, axes affecting these mediators W, could be education, employment, and so on. And this is, gender is also correlated with age and nationality. Age and nationality may be affecting also the, the salary. If you speak better the language and so on, uh, or other reasons, uh, protection of the market and so on. Now, after collecting data, it has, and Drago will show that in practice, I said this is more, will be more theoretical, but after checking, collecting the data, it has been observed that the TV, the E of Y male minus the E of Y female is greater than zero, which means that the, the males are getting higher salaries than the female. I think it's 14K in this data set that we have. $14,000. Now, the, the question is how do we explain these variations? There are different ways of explaining based on what we just discussed. The first possibility or type of explanation could be that the salary decision is, the salary decision is based on the employee's gender. Then this arrow here from X to Y is the one that is active that generated the disparity in TV. Option number one. Not necessarily. Possibly, option number two, decisions were based on the education or employment, meaning maybe the gender is affecting the education level and the education level is affecting if you have a PhD or not, maybe there is a shift there in the distribution about how you are given salaries. These kind of classic arguments from some of the companies. Um, third option is like age or nationality are used to infer the person gender that is through the bi-directed, and in turn, let's say the age is being used, uh, or the nationality is being used as also as an input for the decision process uh, uh, of how to establish salary. Then this is from the third path there, from the, from the top. Now, the, in reality, again, TV encompasses all of these three different, qualitatively different types of variations. If, the truth is that the number one is the variation that, uh, that is going on, this will suggest, that is active, this suggests a, a, a typical case of disparate treatment. On the other hand, if one, two, and three, and the implied disparity in TV are active, this suggests a, a disparate impact case, or at least the beginning of a disparate impact case. Then this is uh, one way of trying to connect them. Um, say that you go to, to exemplify this business necessity. Say that you go there and there's a legal argument between the, the companies and the jury may be okay. The jury will say, I'm okay, or we are okay with the Y variations, variations that are happening with the salary that are due to education. You cannot blame Google or the high tech company for uh, using the PhD level. It's a good proxy for performance. And this is my business necessity. I will go bankrupt if I'm not allowed to look to this attribute in the applicants or in my, in my, employee, in my employees. On the other hand, the, the, the jury, jury may say that it's not okay, not kosher, to use gender and age as an input for deciding how, uh, uh, how, how to give their salaries, the salaries to the employees. Now, question for us, or the, the, the key question here that, uh, that, uh, that we are grappling with, is like how to disentangle, and disentangle in terms of English, or not the, how to disentangle these variations within TV. That's our question. Um, then this leads to some type of attribution, attribution problem. On the one hand, we're considering the observed statistical disparity that is on the top, that we have the TV, the E of Y, male minus female is different than zero. On the other hand, downstairs, we need to ground or attribute the variations to the different legal doctrines or the different paths in reality. Uh, disparate treatment impact and account for this business necessity re reality. We do know, I'm just repeating here, we do know that TV encompasses these di di three different types of variations, the direct, the indirect, and the spurious. Uh, then this entanglement makes the problem of attribution quite hard. Um, what we are looking for is some kind of framework that, uh, or a set of measures that allows us for decomposing the variations that are within TV and connects on the top and connects with the, uh, the measures or the legal doctrines on the bottom. Now, in order to do that, I will define some notions. Uh, stay, stay around. The, the let omega be a class of structural causal model, all possible variations of these different realities. We don't know which one is true. Then let omega be a class of SM in which a structural criterion Q, we are just defined at some of them, related to the E, I, E, and SE. A structural criterion Q, and, uh, and measures mu and mu prime are defined. Now you say that the measure mu is said to be admissible with respect uh, 
uh, to Q, to this structure Q, Q, if for all SCMs M in omega, the Q uh, evaluating this M implies the mu in this M. The zero of this guy, of the zero of the Q implies the zero of the mu. On the, oops, there's an animation issue here. The, the, uh, on the other hand, the measure, the measure mu, mu uh, prime is said to be more powerful than the measure mu if we just operate in the admissible set and the mu prime is equal to zero implies the mu is equal to zero. Now, this, the, these notions, power admissibility, are somewhat, uh, I will leave it like that, but are somewhat analogous of necessity and sufficient for the, the corresponding uh, uh, measures that we have, structural measures that we have. Now, this is one notion that we need. I, we will need, I will try to exemplify. The second notion that we need in order to define the problem of how to disentangle the variations is the notion of decomposability. Um, let omega be a class uh, of SCMs and mu be a measure defined over it. Mu is said to be omega decomposable, or we just call decomposable for now, if there exist measures mu1, mu2, mu k, such that mu is equal to a function of mu1, mu2, mu k, and uh, where the f is a non-trivial fun functions, first function, and vanishing at the origin. The f of each of these guys, 0, 0, 0, will be the f of the, the f as well. The, the, the zero of the mu's would be the zero of the f. Um, the way of, one way of thinking about that, this is the variations within TV. Now, TV is a complicated composite measure that there's many different types of mechanisms that are collapsed there in generating the variations. Um, then you have a measure mu that could be TV, for example, is the one that we, and this captures some subset of the variations that we care about. Um, it could be the whole thing. Now you say that it's decomposable if there exists this mu one, mu two, mu three, which are within the mu and capture the same variations. I think that hopefully with examples this will be clear. Um, let me skip this one. Now just pictorial thing, what we are really saying here, I refine of the previous picture. We have the truth from the bottom that is the M star. We have the structure measures that is the DE, IE, and SC we already discussed and saw this picture. On the other side of the equation, we have the TV fair on the, on the, on the up. And this is a composite measure. Of course, we care about TV or people would care about this because this is immediately accessible from the data. The data allows us to get TV. And it doesn't allow us to get the bottom there. Now, the, what we're trying to find is the following. We, are, we said three things, admissibility, power, and decomposability. Now, we are trying to find this guy in the middle, that is the, gray, the, the, the green area, that are atomic measures that we will construct and satisfy these properties. First one, decomposability. You would like to get these measures that we can get TV, all variations that are in TV that you read from the data and decomposing these different pieces. The E piece, IE piece, for example, and SE piece. This is from the upper side, first property of decomposability. On the other hand, you want the, from the bottom, we want the animation here, but from the bottom, we want the property of admissibility. That if the measures on the bottom, i.e. fair holds, the, the, the measure on the middle here, this guy will also say that there is no, no unfairness. Then this is what the admissibility is capturing. And I will elaborate later, but we want some order among that. Not all admissible measures and not all decomposable families are the same. We want some of them that has some kind of sense of power. They have better granularity of capturing, uh, uh, more statistical power in some sense uh, to capture what we want. Anyhow, that's the kind of picture that hopefully you have in mind and you later on you understand how we are grounding each of the boxes uh, or each of these notions here. But again, the composability, you have the guys truth in the bottom, measurement, measurements on the top TV. And there's a huge gap between them. Now you have these three notions to try to bring them together. The composability, admissibility, and power. Uh, now I will state that, just putting that together in a little bit, it will look cumbersome, but it's just a little bit more mathematical way. Let mu be the fairness measure defined over the space of SCMs omega. Let Q1, Q2, QK be a collection of structural fairness criteria. Uh, we defined it, uh, three of them earlier. The, the, the fundamental problem of causal fairness analysis is to find a collection of measures, mu1, mu2, mu k, such that the following properties holds. We already know them. 
Property number one, mu is the composer with respect to mu one, mu two, mu k. Number two, mu one, mu two, mu k are, is admissible, are admissible with respect to the structure of ferro measures on the bottom. They are q1, q2, qk. And you also like to get the, the measures that are powerful in some sense. Questions, how, how, anyhow, this is the problem. If you want a little bit more mathematical formulation of what we are trying to do. Um, the, and this is uh, definition 13 in section 3.1. Um, now, in order to answer this question, I will need to define, or it would be nice to define something called contrastive measures. A contrast is any quantity of the form uh, P of Y, C1, Y had the value of C being C1, given that E is equal to U1. Now I'm just using this building block. Then Y, C1 given U1 minus Y, C of zero given E0, where E0 and U1 are observed or factual events, and C0 and C1 are counterfactual events to which the outcome Y responds. Now as the contrast, uh, a contrast compares the outcome Y of individuals who coincide with the observed events E0, E1 versus E0 in the factual world versus and whose values possibly counterfactuals were intervened on following the C1 and C0. Now let me try to uh, unpack this thing. Um, and I'll do that by a theorem that I think could be useful. Any contrast in the form uh, that we have described here, and I would like to, to define something called the counterfactual, uh, the, the factual versus the counterfactual basis. It will be important uh, to find these measures that we need in the middle to bind the, what we have in the data versus what we don't observe in terms of the mechanisms. The, any contrast uh, in this form can be decomposed into the factual and the counterfactual components. Um, this is the factual one. Um, sorry, this is the, oops. This is the factual one, yc1 given one minus yc0 given u1. Note here that the u1 is the same, then we are just counterfactually changing the condition here from c0 to c1. Then the difference arises from, oh, from the counterfactual c0 and c1 used to capture the causal, used to capture the causal influence of x and y. This is for the causal influence because this is a counterfactual sub c0 and sub c1. Y sub c0 and sub c1. This is the factual, counterfactual part. In the, I will zoom in soon on this one. But the factual part, note here that we have the same C0 here, then we are comparing the difference arising from the events E0, moving from the event E0 to the event E1, used to capture the non-causal spurious influence of X and Y. Um, now I'd like to make a comment on, or, or zoom in a little bit and try to do the, 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 the structural basis, the composition, or here write that in terms of the SCM. Now, whenever the events E0 and E1 is equal to E, any counterfactual contrast in the form YC1 given E minus YC0 given, YC0 given E admits the following decomposition, structural basic decomposition. Um, this is important. Now, this is very fundamental. If you can understand it, it will be useful. The, you are summing over the U here. And now the first component here, given the use fixed, remember the sampling loop, the sampling evaluation process that we have. You sample and you get a unit U is equal to U1, U2, UK. Now I have this vector here that is the characteristics of the people. Now, once the U is fixed, now we are trying to do this unit level difference between the Y sub C1 for this guy minus the Y sub C0. Then this is called the unit level for a specific unit U. Y is the response to the transition from moving from C0 to C1. On the other hand, we are kind of rating that by a posterior. This is the population of units consistent with the factual evidence or event E is equal to small e. But the variations are coming from here. The variations that are counterfactuals that are coming from this transition here. And this is just the selection of the units. Now, the idea of thinking about the selection of the units that turns out to be important, the, the way that I like to think related to the sampling loop, sampling evaluation loop, this is the space of all units, and this is our, our original P of U. Now, you could say that if you have an event E is equal to X here, small X, then it means that we are no longer sampling from the whole population, but now we are selecting the units that have this particular value, X is equal to small X then this is the P of U given X. And you can keep going on and on until you get a very precise uh, U given V. V is the vector of all possible observed variables. And you can get the delta function here. This is exactly the U is equal to U1, U2, UK. 
that's the unit individual level. Never observable, we, we cannot precisely estimate that, but this is this quantity. Now this is the, the counterfactual contrast. You can also do the factual contrast. Then let's zoom in here, and this is the expression that we have. Whenever the C0 is equal to C1, the counterfactual part is fixed, is equal to C. No variations are coming from there. Then uh, any factual contrast, P of Y sub C E1 minus Y C E0 admits the following uh, basis decomposition. And then you have for each U, you have the Y sub C of U. This is, oops, I have a baseline outcome for a fixed unit U is equal to U. Then variations are not from there because it's fixed, it's just we're waiting. Uh, the difference is coming even for, from this part here. This is the difference in the posterior uh, of how likely the unit U is equal to U is selected under the events E0 and E1. Um, okay, now I will not parse that, but this is just putting what I said in the last three or four slides together. This is the theorem. Uh, important point to see that we can get any contrast in this form, and this is a comeback, any contrast like that, and you can decompose in the counterfactual and the factual counterpart. And what is important here, that we, th this part, the green part here of the expression, is essentially some type of selection over the units, over the P of U, while what we have in the blue here is something about the mechanisms, that is uh, something about the selection of the mechanisms. Um, then this, this allows us to write, I think is a good interpretation that you call the explainability plane. The plane is decomposed exactly in these two components. There is the population, the population axis, that is the selection of the unit axis. This is exactly the picture that we put before. Different, uh, 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 different events, E is equal to E, we imply the different selection of the units. And, uh, and the other dimension is the mechanism dimension. Each selection, different selections of the Cs, the C0 and the C1, you select a different type of mechanism, sometimes the DE, sometimes the IE, sometimes the SE. Then any contrast can be seen in this plane. That's a, a nice thing. Our goal will be kind of navigate that. We start with the general version of the population and trying to go more and more specific. Um, that, that, that's the, the idea here, part of the exercise. How can you, in some way, find a fine point and get the most uh, uh, unit level or, or more juice for the kind of data and assumptions that we have. Um, this discussion. Now I would like to ground that, the, the, because this is abstract, I would like to talk about measures that follow this pattern. I, used to like, I would like to use this theory to explain measures that are classic ones. I will start with the classic one um, in the literature since Pro, uh, you the Pro, Pro uh, 2001. This is a definition by, by him. The Gedenkin experiments about the ND, na National Direct Effect. For a male employee, x is equal to x0, how would his salary y change had he been a female, x is equal to x1, while keeping the age, nationality, education, uh, employment status unchanged? Unchanged here is important, meaning at the, la at the natural level, x is equal to x0, because it is still a male, it's still x0. Then you don't want to change those other attributes. Now I would like to write that in formal notation here using the potential response and the counterfactuals. Um, this is then the uh, quantity. I will parse that through a graph because I think it will make it easier. Now let's start here. There's some kind of uh, contrast. Um, this is the y, y, the value of y had x being x0, comma, the value of w have x being x0 as well. Then what does this mean? This means that we would like to know the variations of y had x been x0, then the variations from x is equal to x0, and the values of w, w is taking x as being x0 as well. Then th this is this w, this is the w x0, and this is going to the y here. Then that's this quantity here. Good. Now this is simple. The one that there's a twist is this one. I would like to contrast whatever we just said with the following. Important here, guys. They move this x0. Now I would like the y to think that the x is equal to x1 that is a female. Then, in other words, what would be the salary had the person think that x is equal to x1, then we are kind of inputting from the y side x is equal to x1, but the w is still, be, w is the age, nationality, education, so on. W still believes that the x is the baseline level that is a, a, a male, that is the x is equal to x0. Then, the, that, that's it. 
that's the, the quantity here, how we write. Now, what is important about that, that when you subtract the guy on the right from the guy on the left, the only thing that is changing here is this, the, the Z to Y is the same in both sides, and the X zero to W to Y is the same in both sides then the only thing that is changing is that the input of y, b, y in the left side believes that x is equal to x1 and y in the right side believes that x is equal to x0. When you subtract the right from the left, the only thing that pops up or that remains are the direct variations or the natural direct variations as pro, pro called at the time. Then th this is called, this is, oops, this is called the di natural direct effect. Now we can do the same second Gedanga experiment here that we can do the NIE. Um, and one, one second, how I'm doing? I have maybe 20 minutes, I think. Yeah, the, then let me do it quickly here. For female employee, X is equal to one. Now we're talking about the female as a baseline. For the female employee, X is equal to X1. How would her salary Y change? Has she been a male? The X is equal to X0 while keeping gender unchanged along the direct causal pathway at the natural level. Let me, oops, I already wrote in counterfactuals here. Note here that the baseline now is female. Then you have Y, X1. The Y thinks that the, the is a female, and the W thinks that is a female. The flip here is now is in the X0 here. You have a W, X0 versus the W, X1, and the Y nested there. But this is nested in the Y. Then note here that for the Y, in this case, it, from the direct path, it believes that this is still a female, there is x1 point in y, but the w, that is all these other attributes that we discussed, believes that it's a male. This is x0 point into w, then this forms the, 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 the counterfactual wx0, and this is the one that is fit in in the y, and becomes the y sub w sub x0. It's a nested uh, counterfactual, as you say. Now, when you subtract the one, this guy, this fellow here in the right, from this one, the only thing that remains that is different, this is Z is the same, X1 is the same. The only thing that is different is this path X0, W, Y, X1, W, Y. Then this is capturing what? This is capturing the indirect variations. It's called the natural uh, indirect effect. UAI 2001. That's very nice, beautiful in reality. It took uh, a few decades until we were able to write. We didn't have a formal language to write this expression here. Now you can, can compute this type of variations. Very beautiful. Now, you can also formalize the notion of uh, uh, Spurs effect when you do the first one, that is a layer two here, a lever two of the ladder. How would the individual salary Y change if their gender is set to male or female by intervention uh, compared to observing the salary as the male? Um, this is the expression. Here we will find that. But this is the expression. We would like to say the Y given X uh, versus the y given do x or the y sub x. Uh, note here, same kind of argument, right? The only difference between when you subtract this guy from this one, from the guy on the left, the only thing that is different is the one, the path that is going through the back, is the path that is going through the, the x to z to y. And that gives rise to the spurious effect, the variations that are coming from the back, from the back door, if you heard about the expression. Um, that's nice. Okay. Now, the, I will not do the full algebra here, but um, what we can do is the following. Some kind of simple argument of the telescoping argument, we can do the following. I'm kind of adding, uh, adding the same guys and removing. Let me not do just for the sake of time. But you get the following result, and, and it's the algebra is trivial. The, the total variation measures can be decomposed into this direct, indirect, and spurious. Meaning, you can write now TV as a function of the NDE, NIE, and the XPC. Then that's a property that we want, decomposability. All the variations of TV can be expressed in the variations of these three fellows, three types of quantities. Yeah, which, yeah, step one. Step two, we like to relate, this is getting TV and try to decompose in the quantities. Now we go from the bottom and try to match whatever you get as the pieces, you like to match that and have admissible measures related to the structural thing, that we don't observe the structure of the E, structure IE, and the structure SC. Then the, let me read the result. The criterion based on NDE and IE and SP measures are admissible with respect to the structural direct, indirect, and spurious fairness. 
Uh, formally, this is just the way, the way that we write that the SD is zero, we imply the ND fair and, and so on. Um, now, why, why is this important? I will just go quickly because there are a lot to be said, but uh, it's just to get a feeling. If this is true that the SDE is, ad the, is admissible, the NDE is admissible, which, which means that this guy is true, now how do you test something? We'll take the contrapositive of the thing because this thing is not measured, the guy here. You can measure the guy in the right. This is computable from the data. Now you measure this guy. If this guy is contrapositive, this guy is different than zero, this implies that there is, this, uh, in this case, direct discrimination, despite the fact that you don't observe the mechanism. That's the idea. Um, and you can do some hypothesis testing, and you can write the whole theory, and there is interesting things to discuss about the statistics of how to evaluate that. Maybe Drago will talk about that or not. I don't know yet, but hopefully I can pass the ball here. Um, the soon, Drago. Don't get nervous with me. The <laughs> now, are we done? Can I pass the ball? Not fully. There's one thing that I would like to add, or a few things, to be honest. But I, I, let me not read the example. But this is an example that is a company kind of hiring. They would like to decide to make the job offer or not. This can be a function of gender. They particularly look to the PhD. Let's say that's a high tech that want to do the gender AI, next technology, gender AI systems, uh, and so on. Now, I, I will not parse here, and it is in the paper. I will index later. The, this is the true mechanism about how people are making decisions in this setting. Now, you can compute the NDE, and then we, I will not do that step by step because it will take a two minutes or three, but you can go one by one from the SCM side, at least hypothetically, you could compute the NDE, and you get at the end something that is equal to zero here. Now, this is funny because if you are the god here, or the system, or the system engineer, the nature, and you know what are the mechanisms, the color is not amazing here, I hope you guys can see, but as a, in, the F of, in the F of Y, there exists an X there. In other words, the company is using gender, and there's a nice story, by the way, in the paper, in the report, but the, the company is using the gender in some way to decide the candidates, to decide if they make the job offer or not. Now, but the NDE is saying no. The NDE is saying everything is kosher, everything is good. Then the, this is example nine. Then the observation here is like the NDE is admissible with respect to the SD. This is one side of the implication. The SD is equal to zero. These will generate ND is equal to zero, but not the other way around. This is why we need, however, here NDE is equal to zero, but structural direct effect exists. Now, now this is why we have this notion of power. We need to find a measure that will be more powerful and will be possibly capable to capture these variations. Um, I will just go quickly here, but you can get the NDE and make it event E is equal to the event E that you have the theory of the compositions. Maybe you can say that we would like to get only the male employees. You can kind of stratify by gender. Then you have the, the X is equal to X zero here. This gives rise to a quantity called the counterfactual direct effect, the CTFDE. This is from the 2018 paper. Um, and important about this function here that the bidirected arrow between X and Z or the, and, and the use are still there. Then we are kind of constraining the population in the sense that we discuss a little bit more. Now, uh, again, I'm not doing the algebra, but if you do the algebra and hopefully you were at home, hopefully I didn't disencourage you or encourage you to have a positive effect, <laughs> the, I hope. But the, the, if you do the algebra, you see that the, the CTFD will be able to capture that the company is discriminating uh, against uh, the female applicants in this case. Um, the, the example 10. Now, key properties of the CTFD, CTFD is admissible. Um, and CTFD is more powerful than the ND in the sense that we discussed of power before. Now I would like to take a step back and try to get a feeling about these notions, of, uh, particularly about power and how to get more unit level. And so far we talked about this, or you could talk about the axis specific measures uh, of fairness. That is exactly the same measures that we have. Anyhow, let me just show the animation here. This, this is the measures. I just talked about the CTFDE. You can do exactly the same for the CTFIE. And you can, there's a little bit of uh, things to say, but you can do the same to the CTFSC, I'll quote unquote the same. And you can get a layer three, a, a very fine grain notion of uh, uh, spurious variations. Now, if you use the theory of decomposing variations, you can write all of these quantities in the form of the sampling evaluation loop that I described maybe half an hour ago. 
And you can see that these quantities that we're talking about here in the axis-specific family or in the counterfactual family are more informative, is, is here, is in this, you're constraining with the P of U given X. Now, interesting enough, before the, the quantities or some of the quantities that were known, such as the NDE by, by, by Pro and, and so, the NDE here, this is coming from this le level here that is an average P of U over the population. And you can kind of, anyhow, the X specific is more powerful than the general, has a better uh, probability uh, or possibility of detecting uh, the discrimination in this underlying mechanism. Now, and I'll go fast, but you can go one by one here and I will not go, but we can, we can kind of get it more and more inside, closer and closer to something that will be the delta or the unit level with the U is equal to U1, U2, and so on. I will skip the Z specific because it's exactly the same. Turns out Z specific is more informative under the SFM, under the structural model, but not in general. Um, then Z specific is more informative than the X specific. We can show that, so on. Nice. And you can have the V prime specific. You can get all set of observable or subsets of the observable covariates and just condition, and you'll be in the one that is closer to the delta here that is this point. Um, good. There's no SC and there's no spurious effect, but uh, given that you are controlling for confounding under the SFM, but it's a technicality. Um, and we have the unit level measures here written. The same thing recall, guys, y sub x1 wx0 versus yx0 wx0, but it is implied. It's simplified here, but it's x0 wx0. This is, the, uh, anyhow, th this is exactly the unit level quantities that are here that we call, we call this the, the uh, structural basis. And everything was decomposed in terms of these guys. Um, that's nice. Now, uh, I'm almost done. Um, the, the, I have more 10 minutes, Drago, because I'm lost time here. Because when, when I end escape, I lost my counter. It was a tough, bad move. Um, the, now I like to put that together, guys. There's like lemma. There's some structure here because we are going painstakingly quantity by quantity and trying to organize there. There is a structure. And the structure goes as follows. Um, connecting here with the, with the theory of the compositions that we have. Note here, let me put the direct effect. Here I'm going, this is the population, the units. This is the general population. If you're just sampling, this is x is equal to x, z is equal to z and so on. And the unit level here on the bottom. Note here that you go level by level and you have the counterparts that is related to the direct effect that is given by this, the, the choice of the C's. This pattern here, these guys are the same throughout. Then when you instantiate this C0 and C1, you are kind of selecting a particular type of mechanism. In this case, direct effect. And you are kind of moving across the different types of units. You are kind of instantiated differently, the E0 and the E1. Now you can do the, oops, I had the animation. That's this, they are the same, these guys. Um, now for the indirect, we have the same. You can get all of these guys across the levels. The, and I don't think I have animation, but these guys are the same. This guy, this guy are just selecting different units, but uh, uh, more and more unit level. But this is a selection of the mechanisms. And you can do the same with the spurious. Now, uh, after some point, there is no more spurs because you are controlling for these variations. Then it's no longer that, but it's again a technicality. But anyhow, that's how it looks. Um, there is some kind of nice structure there how to navigate and explain any of the measures that you can find. Um, of course, if you collapse these two guys, the direct and the indirect, in reality, direct plus indirect is equal to causal. Then there is also some kind of, th those are the, the, the causal variations that you like, the downstream effect from X to the Y, for not being specific about the, the, the mechanism. And if you collapse the causal together with the spurious, you get exactly the first line that is the variations that you have the TV. And you can kind of open up and move across this quantities in a nice way through the theory and understand. Now putting that together, this leads us to my last bit here. Um, that is the, the, something that we call the fairness map. The different ways of parsing that is a lot of information, but there is a structure, which is nice. The, the way that I like to parse is using what we already talked. On the x-axis, you have the mechanism axis, and the, three, the, the last guys here is what is, we know very well about spurious direct and indirect. The, 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 these, three, these three guys here. 
I added a new column in the mechanism axis that is a collapse guide that is the causal column. Because everyone likes the causal for other reasons and there are also instances in the literature that they care about the, the causal column. But not my preference. In the same, even though I like causal, you can put heart, which is not my, I prefer the these guys, the atomic ones, because they match exactly the underlying mechanisms. Then or one to one. The, the, but okay, but this is the columns and this is the mechanism axis. You also have the popula population axis. On the top, you have the general one, that this is the, the, the P of U, if you're just sampling at random from the population. Here we have sampling for the axis equal to X, and you keep going until you get the unit level. Then this is the Y axis. Um, it turns out that everyone below this arrow here is structural, meaning we don't have access to them. They are just there, but we, we can never get it. Um, now you can keep going up and up and you get something that is closer and closer to the data in some way. You can move from the V-specific to the Z-specific and so on until you move to the general population specific. That's one way of moving along. Um, another way, and each, uh, I forgot to say something, each box here is a different quantity, a different uh, quantity, anyhow, it seems a zoo, but they are very well organized and they are connected. Now, these quantities here, this box is the NDE, for example. This box is the NIE that we talked. This is the CTFDE, and so on. Now, the first result that appeared after more than 10 years, that it was possible to show that the TE, that is not my favorite quantity, I have to admit, in this context, but the TE in another context is very important, the TE can be decomposable, or is decomposable in terms of the NIE, NIE. It's a fundamental result, because it allows us to think about that. This problem exists about decomposing the variations. Um, we can do that by, by extended version of that layer by layer. There's some kind of ST extended mediation formula that you can do. Um, the interesting for us here, I think that is uh, uh, awesome, in, in fairness, that in reality, we're trying to sp explain not the TE, but we're trying to explain the TV, because we never know, and we would like to, to, to account for different impact as well, not only the disparate treatment that is related to the notion of total effect or direct effect. Now, you can do the decomposition, the one that I showed here, that I, we showed the TV can be decomposed in terms of the TE and the X plus C. There are other decompositions of this kind. Uh, this is another one that is for the, the first one that we have in our paper in, in 18, the Jang and Barenboim, uh, that we, are, I started, we started visualizing things like that. Uh, there are more uh, structure in the first decomposition that I'm aware about the TV. I'm aware, if you know, drop me a line. Um, the, okay, this is the theorem seven, that is the fairness map. Um, I think I can pass the ball. You want to do this one or yeah. you do? Okay, I'll pass the ball to Drago here. Uh, thank you for the attention. Drago, you connect with other measures in the literature. Drago, the floor is yours. And, <laughs> thank you. So uh, thanks to Elias for setting, setting the theoretical framework up. So what we want to do now is we want to try to, to first connect the, every, the theoretical framework that was mentioned to the previous, uh, previous work in the literature, and then also to show how the theoretical framework can be used in practice, all right? And just, uh, just out of curiosity, if I can see by show of hand, how many people in the audience have heard of the criterion called counterfactual fairness? Is this familiar? Can you raise your hand? Okay, quite a few people. I'm very glad. So this is one of the, one of the, one of the things that we're going to speak about. There's a lot of detail in the, detail in the paper about this criterion, and you can, you can have, I'll have a pointer to where you can see more details. But there's a lot of implications uh, from our framework about this specific criterion. In particular, the fairness map that Elias showed Will allow us to will allow us to place this criterion and see where this criterion actually lies. So we're going to have a much better understanding using the fairness map of what the counterfactual uh, fairness criterion does. And uh, the other criterion that we we want to talk about, and this will be mentioned very briefly. There's a lot of details in the paper. is is another is another approach which is the individual fairness uh, approach of Cynthia Dwork and colleagues from 2012. This paper is actually called Fairness Through Unawareness. You might know it, th Fairness Through Awareness, sorry. You might know it under that name. But I will briefly mention some thoughts on, on this paper as well. Okay, so what can we say about counterfactual fairness? So Elias mentioned this, this, this underlying structure, right? We're on the top, we are thinking about quantities that measure the discrimination in the entire population and 
towards the bottom, we are really going towards quantities that are more individualized, right? And this is one of the things that, that is mentioned in the, and exemplified in the counterfactual fairness paper. The, the authors there are saying, we're trying to find something that is more and more individual. And what, what, what I'm trying to say is that the, the measure that the, the authors describe in the paper is somewhere in the bottom of the, of the fairness map, right? So it's close to the structural level. And there are some advantages of this and some disadvantages that I will mention shortly. So specifically what I want to say is that uh, in, the, in the paper itself, it's not entirely clear whether it's, it's a W prime total effect or a unit's total effect. But what is definitely clear that uh, the variations captured by the counterfactual fairness criterion are the entire causal variations, right? So the counterfactual fairness criterion doesn't really distinguish between direct and indirect effects. And if you think about the connection that we had with the legal doctrines, such as, uh, such as disparate impact and disparate treatment, uh, you can see that this is very important, right? So putting the causal variations together can, in certain cases, provide uh, give a limitation. And the other thing that you can notice from this is that the, the spurious effect is not accounted in this, in this story at all. I'll come back to, to this in the next slide. So basically, what, what, we, what we, I think, is the, the correct interpretation of counterfactual fairness is this is actually a unit-level total effect. And as, as, as I did mention, uh, what we know and from, from what uh, Elias showed is that this, there, there is this general uh, decomposition principle that we can apply to the counterfactual fairness criterion. So in some sense, counterfactual fairness is, is now circled in red, but what you can see is that within that criterion itself, we have the direct and the indirect effect as well. And what this shows is that by, 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 by another lemma that Elias mentioned, this also shows that, 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 that the counterfactual uh, fairness criterion is actually not admissible with respect to the direct and indirect effects, okay? And what, what we also want to say is that unit level quantities, because they're so close to the structural level and the structural level is not, uh, not observed by us, they're very difficult to compute in practice, okay? So under you only can actually evaluate counterfactual fairness under very, very strong assumptions. So the causal graph itself is almost never going to be enough un unless in very specific parametric circumstances. Okay, so this, these are the two, two uh, takeaway points from this slide. And what I want to say as well is, as I mentioned, there's no spurious, uh, spurious effect in the counterfactual fairness criterion. And this is something that, uh, that the authors make an, as an assumption in the manuscript. They say, there's, there's a, the, uh, they assume a central closure of the protected attribute set. And we're now asking, is this a realistic assumption in practice or is this uh, a possible limitation? And as it turns out that if you, if you, if you look at some data sets, and if you look at the, the, the I think I hear I have the Compass data set. So what, what happens in Compass data set is uh, the, the, the confounding variables are, are age and I think gender in this case. And what you can check is you can check the correlation of these, of these variables with the protected attribute and the correlations are non-zero. So what we know as well is that there's a lot of literature on different types of discrimination that are actually spurious discrimination. So if you know about redlining when people get declined loans because of the location where they live, if you think about this problem, this is not a causal, this is not a causal issue. This is a spurious variation that is happening. So in some sense, what we want to say is that this is a lack, lack of accounting for spurious effect is, is a problem in counterfactual fairness. So to summarize and to point you to, oops, sorry. To point you to, to where this is in the paper, we want to we wanna say that these are the three, three possible issues with the, with the criterion. Is that the, the criterion is decomposable and inadmissible, and it's not identifiable in full generality. And thirdly, it, does, it is oblivious to, to spurious effects, which can, which can be a limitation, as we will see later. So in section 4.4.1 of the, of the technical report, you can see the, the technical details of this. Uh, all right, so for the fairness through unawareness paper, I'm going to keep it brief because uh, we can have a very extens extended debate on, on, on this paper, which is very interesting. And what we're trying to, what, we're, what we've done in the, in the te technical report, we've looked at the causal aspects that, that the authors themselves 
are not, they're not using a causal framework. We're now trying to see what the causal viewpoint on this paper would be. And some of the things, one first, uh, first observation is that the individual fairness or the, the framework that the authors propose is oblivious to the causal mechanisms. And there are examples in the, in the, in the paper that where we show that this can lead to, to certain kinds of problems. So in particular, you can look at the example 17 in the paper. So secondly, what the individual fairness cr uh, criterion itself implies, it's actually some notion of direct effect. And this is one of the important realizations here. So, and actually it's, it's a notion of a direct effect, but this, this only is true if you have the assumption of the standard fairness model that, the, that Elias introduced. And if you go to the manuscript and you, if you look at some of the propositions, if, if, if you don't have the SFM assumptions, then IF is not, not measuring a direct effect. It's measuring something else. And those of you familiar with, with the uh, IF framework will know that the, the framework relies on, on, on a metric, right? You're somehow trying to measure the distance between individuals. And two results that are sort of crucial in this part is that if the, if the metric that you're using to, to, to measure the distance between individuals, if this is a sparse metric, and by this I mean it doesn't include all the variables in the data set, you can run into issues. And actually this metric will, be not, will not be admissible to any of the structural measures of direct, indirect, and spurious effect that we have introduced. And this is exemplified in, in example 18 in the, in the paper. And lastly, if, if you have a complete metric D, then what you get is you, you, you have an issue because you, you have a hard time accounting for, for business necessity considerations. Okay, so the is, it, disparate impact doctrine is gonna be hard to evaluate if the, if the metric D is, is complete. So in some sense, both, both a sparse metric and a complete metric can cause, cause issues with, uh, if you're using the IF framework. And I refer you to the paper for, for, for more details on this. But what I wanna talk about next is I wanna talk about the practical aspects of causal fairness analysis. And I wanna show how everything that Elias introduced can actually be used in practice and how, how it might uh, help us better understand discrimination in, in the data sets that, that we're looking at. And this is, the, this is, I guess, the second part of the, of the of the talk in which I'm, I'm borrowing everything, I'm borrowing the entire framework here, right? So all the structural fairness and the, and the empirical measures and, and, uh, and the doctrines, they're, they're all the same. So everything that, is, that has been spoken about is relevant for, the, for what is to follow. And what I'm really focusing now on are these three tasks that were introduced in the beginning, right? So I first wanna talk about the task of device detection. After that, I wanna talk about the task of, of fair prediction in which instead of just diagnosing whether there is discrimination, we're actually trying to correct for discrimination. And in the last task, you might wanna think about how to do some kind of affirmative action in, uh, in, in the real world. Uh, this task number three is, is not, uh, not gonna be discussed. I'm gonna focus on the first two tasks uh, due to limitations of, of time. Uh, so this is this is where I'm heading now, okay? And I especially specifically want to start with task one, which is concerned with bias detection and uh, bias quantification. So to this end, to to perform bias detection and to to sort of try to assess whether certain doctrines, certain legal doctrines, are are uh, are are violated in the data sets or whether they are actually, whether there's actually a reason to be concerned from a legal standpoint about discrimination in the data. For the, to this end, we introduced the fairness cookbook. So this is, this is an algorithm actually that I'm, that I'm gonna describe quickly. And uh, you, you, you'll get a feeling for what's going on as I go through the steps. So initially, what, what we always need, right? Uh, anyone, anyone working with AI, we need some data on past decisions, right? This is the, this is the first step. The second step, as Elias said, without, without any kind of causal assumptions, we're gonna have a very hard time assessing the legal doctrines. But what we wanna propose in this, uh, in this setting is to, to determine the causal diagram in form of the st standard fairness model. So you need to do some clustering on the variables. You need to say what the confounders are, you need to say what the mediators are, okay? And then what you need to do is you need to go, you need to think about, you need to go probably to a quiet room as people like to say, and think carefully about what the business necessity set is. So in the fall, so I'll, I'll give an example. So as Elias said, if the mediator is something like, something like a PhD degree. So for a tech company, it might be essential to use this uh, and it might be related to the, to, to, the, to the success of their business and it might be uh, considered non-discriminatory to use this inf information from a legal standpoint. And 
in this way, you could argue in a similar fashion about confounders and so on. And basically what I'm saying is depending on the situation, discrimination, some of the indirect or some of the spurious discrimination might be considered okay or not okay. And this is described precisely by the business necessity set, okay? And what we, what we do then, and this is, I guess, the first, the first formal step of, of trying to assess whether there is disparate treatment, Yes, yes. I, 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 my point, I think, for number three is that it's, it's, it is some kind of societal consensus, but it's in the hands of the fairness analyst to choose which specific business necessity set uh, we want to have. But to formally test, after, after doing the first three steps, to formally test whether there is some kind of disparate treatment in the data, we compute what Elias introduced and called the counterfactual direct effect, right? So what, the, what this tries to do is tries to quantify the variations going only through the direct mechanism. For, for a specific subgroup that, for example, corresponds to females in the data set. And then what we're doing is we're testing, we're testing a hypothesis. And if we reject this hypothesis that this effect is equal to zero, that means that there is some disparate treatment in the data, right? And if we don't reject, then we are somehow safe with respect to this doctrine at least, right? So we're not thinking that there, there's anything bad going on with, with respect to this doctrine. And Okay, so that's, that's disparate treatment. And as we said, this is direct effect and it's slightly easier. The more complicated doctrine is the disparate impact doctrine. And in this doctrine, we're somehow concerned with more variations at the same time. And to this end, to, to evaluate whether disparate impact exists, we're gonna consider first the indirect effect. And here, and this is the key point, if the W set, if the mediators are, in the, are, are not in the business necessity set, then we're gonna perform hypothesis testing. If they are in the business necessity set, then this would mean that the variations going through the mediators are actually accepted by society. And if this is the case, then we don't need to perform any kind of hypothesis testing, okay? So as Elias said, if it's business necessity, it's kosher to discriminate based on this. But if it's not, then we need to perform this test. So we're taking the analogous quantity of the, of the direct effect, but we're taking the analogous indirect effect quantity. And we're doing a similar kind of hypothesis testing. And unsurprisingly, perhaps, we do the same thing for the spurious effect, right? So, so we repeat a very similar procedure for the spurious effect that we've just done for the indirect effect. And this allows us to, uh, to determine whether there is spurious or indirect uh, discrimination in the data set. Uh, good. So that's, that's how it works. That's how Fairness Cookbook works in practice. You can read about it in section 5.1. It's algorithm one. And what we want to talk about now is we want to give a specific example and show you why, why uh, causal fairness analysis can actually be useful. And this is, the, this is the census 2018 data set, which is actually quite nice. A lot of you will be familiar with the UCI adults data set, which is a very old, very old data set. Census 2018, as you can see from the stamp, is, is more recent, but you get similar type of behavior. So basically, the protected attribute is gender. Uh, the outcome of interest is, is salary. And the mediators here are going to be education and employment information. And the demographic variables such as age, nationality, and location are going to be the confounders. And what, what, what Elias mentioned, we have a $14,000 a year disparity between, between, the, between males and females in this data set, right? And what we want to do now is we want to think, OK, there's this disparity. There's 14,000 of, of difference to explain. How is this explained by the direct, indirect, and the spurious effect? And when you apply the Fairness Cookbook, and uh, I, I hope uh, some of you will go to our uh, GitHub repository and actually use the code that we have produced for all of this and, and play with it. So what you can see for this data set is you can see a lot of the variation is actually explained by the direct effect, which is here in green. And some of the variation still is explained by the indirect and the spurious effect. But if you go to the Fairness Cookbook and you, so basically the three, so in red we have the total variation, right? And the, the other three boxes add up to the total variation by the theorem that, that Elias showed about the decomposition. And what we're seeing here that there is some concern about disparate treatment, right? And there's also possible uh, concern about disparate impact, right? Because the spurious and the indirect effects are non-zero. And now comes a twist. So basically, if you're not using causal fairness analysis, you could be like you 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 cannot distinguish this case from the following case, in which actually the the total variation stays the same, 
but suddenly the direct and indirect and spurious effects have wildly different values than, than, than it was shown in the previous plot. And in this case, if you think of, of the spurious, of the Z set being in the business necessity, what you will find is that the, co the cookbook will now tell you that there's no disparate treatment or disparate impact in this data. So we are now, if we ignore the, the causal structure and the causal measures, we could, be, we could be missing out on some very, very nuanced points in, in this data, right? Um, okay, so that's I think the main takeaway that we want to say about about bias detection. What we want to talk about next and give some give some insight about uh, is is to give some insight about task two, which is concerned with fair predictions, right? So so now we had we had an example of 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 how to test for whether the legal doctrines are violated or not. Now the question is, if you find that there is something wrong with the data, and uh, many of you working with data will know that it, a lot of the time that actually there are problems with the data. How do we correct for this? So what is the next step? How can we how can we alleviate the issue in some sense? And what we're trying to do is we're first trying to understand uh, the previous literature and what 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 currently is sort of the the go-to procedure and what is done on on these biased data sets. Uh, for just for simplicity, I'm going to introduce and I mean, I'm going to go through this quickly because I, I'm assuming everyone in the audience is very familiar with this. The typical problem of prediction. I'm just going to frame it slightly causally. So basically, what what we're dealing with, we we start with this observed reality, right? And bias detection, we look at the data set that someone gives to us. We just observe it. We don't do anything with it. In prediction, in general prediction, machine learning, we are somehow adding a mechanism that is under our, our control, right? So we're we're providing predictions now based on the data. And somehow the goal is for this Y hat that we're constructing, the predictor, to be similar to Y, right? We want to mimic Y in some sense. And typically, the most standard toolkit would be to just learn the conditional distribution of Y uh, on, the, on the covariates, right? And the question is, does this type of approach carry bias over? And of course, if, if, if the answer was no, we wouldn't be here now. The answer is clearly yes, uh, this does carry bias over. And simply learning the conditional distribution is going to carry over the bias that has been imprinted on this data from past decisions. And now the question is, how do we how do we solve this problem? And to do this, we we want to enforce a fairness constraint usually on the on the predictor that we are constructing. And a commonly considered fairness constraint is to make this uh, difference in conditional expectations or the TV measure to equal to zero. And just a quick remark that I, I think uh, is important here. A lot of the stuff that we're talking about here might be specific to the TV, but actually if you think about causal fairness analysis and decomposability and all of that, it, it works for many other measures as well. You can take some kind of uh, correlation, you can take a quality of odds, you can take all kinds of different criteria and same, same conclusions will actually apply. And uh, so to, 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 to ensure this constraint, the TV equals to zero, there, there are three, three sort of different ways that are commonly, commonly used in the literature, three broad classes of method that I would, methods that I would like to, like to talk about. And I, I just have as a, as, a, as a diagram, I have the typical workflow in which you feed in the data to the algorithm and the algorithm constructs a predictor for you. So the first class of methods is called post-processing. And what post-processing does is the, the predictions that you have obtained, you just massage them in a way to satisfy the TV constraint, right? So you don't, once you have the predictions, you don't look at the data or the raw data anymore. You only look at the, you only need the labels uh, of the protected attribute and the predictions to, to transform the data into a fair prediction. The, the second option that you can think about is incorporating this fairness constraint that the TV equals to zero to the, to the learning process, right? This is called in-processing and there, there are many methods uh, that work like this in the literature. And the third, the third option is to actually transform prior to actually using a learning algorithm to transform the data, right? And this, this we call pre-processing. And the hope here is that by transforming the data a priori, we remove the bias. And then after that, if we're using the prediction algorithm, we will not run into issues. And now the question is, if, if we go to a standard, uh, standard method in the literature that is agnostic to, uh, to, to causal inference, is it gonna perform well in a causal sense? Can we formulate something about this? Can we, can we say more, right? So what is the implication of this decomposability on, uh, on, on methods that, that work like this? And 
this brings us to, to one of the main results that we have in under task two, which we call the fair prediction theorem. And I'm, I'm gonna try and spend a bit of time here parsing because this is actually quite an important message to send uh, to many people in the audience who are using uh, fair prediction algorithms. And it roughly goes as follows. So we are, we are interested in, so the, the theorem is written out formally. I will, I will explain intuitively what we mean by this. So what we really wanna do is we want to know what happens uh, if you apply a fair prediction method to a random SCM. And currently in the fair prediction theorem, we're focusing on in-processing methods, but there's reason to believe it might, uh, might work for pre-processing methods as well. But basically what we're trying to do is we're, we're, thinking of a, we're thinking of a graph like this that is compatible with the standard fairness model. And then what we're trying to do for, for the purpose of the theorem, we're thinking about linear structural causal models that are compatible with this graph. And in some sense, we want to we wanna have some notion of a random structural model. You can think of this as uh, sort of uh, considering different companies. You go to Google, Facebook, Amazon, or these different places. And these, these different places will have slightly different decision mechanisms, right? And this is represented by the randomness in the coefficients of the, of the linear system that we're picking, right? And what, what happens then is we now, now that we have this fixed system that was chosen from a, from a model of, of, over a space of SEMs, the question is, when is this, when is applying fair prediction to this, to this, uh, to this structural causal model, or, or even better to say, to the data arising from the structural causal model, when is this going to behave nicely in the causal sense? And by this, I, I need a bit of time to define what I mean exactly. So what we're doing is we're adding this y hat, and this y hat, for simplicity, is just the minima minimizer of the mean squared error on this data, and we're minimizing the mean, mean squared error subject to the TV constraint being equal to zero. Okay, and uh, now the trick is the following. So the question is, after you get this y hat, we're wondering, is the, is the direct effect of, of this predictor gonna be small? Is the indirect effect gonna be small? Is the spurious effect gonna be small? Are there any guarantees that are provided by these algorithms for, for these causal effects? And the answer here is no, because th these algorithms are, are only looking at the TV measure, which is bringing all these variations together. So when you're minimizing th this TV, squashing it to zero, you don't really know what's gonna happen with, with, with the causal measures of fairness. And this can be, this, can, this is a formal argument in the paper. And what we can show is that uh, the, the SEMs in which, in, which, uh, in which the causal measures are equal exactly to zero is a measure zero set. So you will never have perfectly, all of your causal measures be equal perfectly to zero. And the second question you might wonder is, okay, I'm, I'm not really interested in having everything perfectly zero, but it should still be small, right? You, you're hoping that the indirect and direct and spurious effects are gonna be small, if nothing. And the answer is no here as well. So actually for, for, for an epsilon, so for any size of this, any size of the confounder set and, up and mediator set, there is an epsilon such that there's a non-zero non probability that that things will go wrong, okay? And that's, the, that's somehow the takeaway. There's no guarantee, and you can make a formal measure theoretic, in a measure theoretic sense, you can make a formal argument why things can go wrong if you're, if you're just using fair prediction methods that are agnostic to, uh, to the causal structure. And uh, I'm just gonna briefly, so this is section 5.2 in theorem 10. I briefly wanna talk about uh, how one might prove this. I'm gonna go over it quickly, but I personally uh, believe, and I think Elias agrees strongly, there's some beautiful mathematics underlying this. There's a ge ge geometric argument that I think is really nice. So just to, just to give a quick high level view of how you might prove this, is you start by you start by writing out this linear SCM, and here the the coefficients are are labeled as a. They're generated randomly and uniformly from 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 a certain fixed range. And what you what you know as well, you you know what the graphical structure of this system is like. And because the system is linear, you can expand the objective, right? So you can expand the 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 expressions for the for the y mechanism and for the y hat mechanism, and you can somehow get a feeling for what the what the mean squared error of this is. And if you look closely at what you get, you get an optimization problem in which you, you're minimizing some kind of quadratic form, right? And this is this is common. This is absolutely right. This is this is pretty standard. And you're optimizing this over this these new coefficients, right? So we're trying to find the new coefficients for the y hat mechanism. And this is a quadratic form. And in the middle, there's this. Uh, 
there's this expectation of uh, V, V transpose. This is just the covariance structure of the data, basically. So this, this optimization problem depends on the covariance structure in some sense. And this geometrically, this represents an ellipsoid. And at the same time, we shouldn't forget, we are trying to enforce a, a TV constraint, which in this case just boils down to a linear constraint. So this is what we're doing in, in the fair prediction theorem. But what we really want, if you think about what we really want, we want three separate constraints on the direct, indirect, and spurious effects, right? This is somehow our goal. It's not the TV, but it's, it's, the, it's the more refined version that we want to minimize. And if you, if you go and think about what, what this does in uh, geometrically, so we start off with, with the fixed point that represents this SCM that we have sampled from from sampled at random in some sense, and the the the, the hyperplane through the origin actually represents the space uh, the space of models which actually satisfy the TV constraint, right? So we know that or the origin has to the hyperplane has to go through the origin, and what is going on is that the the ellipsoid. Here is the ellipsoid with the characteristic matrix, which is just the covariance matrix of this system, right? And if you think about how the covariance structure of this random system is it works, it depends on these random coefficients that we choose, right? So there's some randomness in how this ellipsoid looks like. And there's some randomness also in the, 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 the hyperplane. So the direction of the hyperplane also has some randomness. And basically what goes on is the, 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 what we're doing is, so the ellipsoid describes somehow the contours of the optimal solution here. And we are thinking in, in, a, in a, to, to be intuitive, we're thinking of inflating this ellipsoid until it hits the hyperplane where TV is equal to zero. And now what we're asking is what is the, what is the probability that we're gonna hit exactly at origin? And if you think about if you think about this kind of randomness, so you have a hyperplane and an ellipsoid, they're random. The the chance that when you inflate the ellipsoid, it goes exactly into the origin. This is this is pretty clear measure zero, right? You need to make this formal, right? Because there are many technical aspects. But here here we can we can provide uh, a, a sort of a mathematical reasoning that shows that this measure is is actually very very small. Okay, so. Uh, as I said, we're measuring the probability of ellipsoid hitting a specific point in, in a bigger subspace, right? So if you think about linear spaces, it, you're, you're unlikely to end up in a specific subspace of a linear space, right? In probability, I, I think there are many results of this flavor in some sense. And now you're saying, okay, that's a theorem. This, that, though it's linear, so I'm not sure if I believe you. Like this could all be, this could all be somehow irrelevant for, for actual practice. And the thing is that it's not, right? Uh, and if you do this with real data, you are finding this theorem all over the place. So what, what we've done is in the, in the top left corner, so I have the same decomposition uh, as before. So these, these, um, these plots are analogous to the pl plots that I've shown, shown before. So what we have in the top left corner is we're just training, we're using the compass data set and we're just training the predictor to, uh, to predict the, the outcome, right? And what you can see is, okay, no fairness constraints, you get a pretty large disparity between the groups, right? So the, the minority group here is discriminated, right, in terms of the TV. And what you can do is you can decompose and see what you get in terms of the causal measures. And what is interesting is that if you take some of the very famous methods in the literature and you apply them to fix for this mistake, so for this disparity to minimize the TV, and we've used reweighing and uh, reduction approach and the reject option classifier some of these methods might be familiar to you and as you can see for from from the other three plots all of these all of these algorithms succeed at what they promised to do so they promised to minimize the TV which is in red I remind you so they all minimize the TV but if you look at the if you look more closely into the notions of uh, direct indirect and spurious effects these are not minimized, right? So if you look at the, the green and the blue and the, and the purple, there, there, is still, there could still be issues, right? So in some sense, even after doing fair prediction, are we, are we okay with this spread treatment? Are we okay with this spread impact? Is, is, is that, is that uh, working out or not? Uh, okay, so that was that was the the practical the practical finding that that we have. One thing that I want to want to talk about uh, in the in the conclusion towards towards ending this is I want to talk about the failure of optimal transport methods. So the fair prediction theorem talks about in processing methods, and then you say, oh no no, but I'm not doing in processing. I'm doing pre processing, which which we believe is actually good. But if you do it again by ignoring the causal structure, you're going to run into issues. And this 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 example is more motivated by the, by the individual fairness uh, framework of, of work at, uh, at Alia. 
And what I don't want, to, I want you to parse this example, it's in the manuscript, but uh, we're, st we, we, we're using a very simple graph in which the, the indirect effect is, is absent. So there's no arrow from X to W, so the indirect effect needs to be zero. And what we're doing then is we're trying to do some kind of optimal transport. We're trying to match the observed distribution of the, of the data for the females onto the observed distribution for the males, right? And this constructs us a, a transport map. And those familiar, uh, those of you familiar with optimal transport will, uh, will, will know this example. So if you, if you look, at this, uh, ge ge look at this geometrically, what the SCM on the previous slide, what it induces, it induces a, a distribution, right? And it induces two distributions in particular. One in blue is for the, for the males, and uh, in red for the, for the females. And what we're doing then, we're, we're doing a transport map. And what, how the example is constructed is that the distances vertically are much, much larger than the horizontal distances, okay? And when you do joint transport, and people who work with optimal transport will know that doing jointly is clearly very different than doing marginally and sequentially. So basically, what, what will happen is you will not perform any transport across, across the y-axis, right? So your transport map will only go horizontally. And you're now thinking, okay, is this, is this an issue per se? And what you can notice is that the transport, transported value, so the corrected value of W, would actually depend on the, on the value of Y, okay? So in some sense, what we know as well, the, the mediators causally precede the value of Y, and now suddenly the transported value of, of, the, of the mediators is depending on Y. So you can see that this, this joint optimal transport step induces some kind of, uh, some kind of uh, irregularity in the causal structure, right? The SFM is no longer valid, and this can actually be uh, proved formally, and this is, this is just for completeness, but you can prove formally that if you perform this in this, in this specific example, you will end up with an indirect effect uh, that is different than zero. So doing optimal transport jointly, which is a pre-processing method, can cause issues if you're not, uh, not uh, careful with the causal structure. So that was then 20 something minutes of, of negative results. This cannot be done. This is a problem. This is an issue. What we're looking for next, right? Are, we, we've, we've diagnosed some problems and we don't want to leave with this, uh, with this uh, taste, right? We want to say something uh, positive and we're gonna, we want to say how can we address these issues, right? And uh, the, the broad question is how can we construct fair predictions that are causally meaningful, right? So that's, that's somehow the, the broad theme here. And we have seen in-processing, bad pre-processing can cause a problem with the, with the causal structure. So what do we do for fair causal predictions? And here there are two, two, two principles that we, we try to follow, which are quite abstract. I'm gonna mention them very quickly. Like for those interested, I, I, I refer to the, to the actual paper because th these points are quite subtle. What I'm gonna do next, I'm gonna talk specifically about how we can fix the optimal transport approach, okay? But in some sense, what the problem was with the optimal uh, with the optimal transport was that we have broken the structure of the SFM, right? So this is the first observation. We should not break the structure of the standard fairness model. And the second thing with the, the problem with the in-processing was that the, the, the effects of direct, uh, so D, E, S, E, and I, E were not zero. So we have minimized the TV, but these were not zero. So we preserved, in, in, in point one, we're okay because we didn't break the structure when doing in-processing, but in point two, we have failed. So these are two points that, uh, that are broad and there's a proposition in the manual manuscript in section 5.2.8 that formalizes these intuitions. But what I want to talk about, and sorry, just to, yeah, and also in section 5.2.9, we give a formal, uh, formal uh, solution for how to fix the in-processing methods, right? You need to do something more complex. Instead of minimizing just the TV, you need to actually minimize the expressions for the direct effect, indirect effect, and the spurious effect. So this is in section 5.2.9, but this is not of core interest maybe. Right now, what I want to talk about is how do we fix the, the pre-processing part? So how do we fix the, the, the optimal transport approach that was described? And here, what we do is we define what we call causal individual fairness, which, which is an algorithm that proceeds as follows. So we start with the SFM, so we have the same structure as before. We, we observe some data 
from from this SFM. And what what we what causal what, what sorry what IF does it transports the distribution of Z, W, and Y the conditional distribution it transports it jointly between males and females. Right. What we're doing now we're doing something similar in flavor, but we're trying to respect the causal structure, and we do it in the following sense. So in the first step. Uh, and here, I, I, this is somehow conditional on business necessity, but let's assume that the business necessity set is empty for simplicity. So basically what we do in the first step, we transport the conditional distribution of Z of, for, for females onto the male distribution. And this results in correcting the, the bias in Z. And we have now some new values that are labeled Z tilde. And somehow there is no disparity. The, the distribution for males and females in Z will be the same. And what we do in the next step is we, we, we do a very similar, very similar step, but we condition on the, on the Z values as well, right? So this represents this causal ordering in the causal structure. So we, we do optimal transport, but we do it on the W set, but by conditioning on, on Z. And we obtain in this way the corrected version of the mediators as well, right? And in the last and final step, we, we, we transport the, ver the, the distribution of Y conditional on Z and W, and we get the correct, corrected values for the, for the Y, uh, for the Y, for the, for the labels, basically. And what can be shown formally from this is that, and this, this procedure is formally described in uh, section 5.2 and in theorem 11, what can be shown is that uh, this actually works, and this is, this is we, we can tick the box here. So we are preserving the causal structure, and the direct, indirect, and spurious effects are actually zero. So there's a positive result from this uh, causal IF procedure, if you want to call it. And this theorem just basically says what I've said before. So if you if you perform uh, optimal transport in this sequential sequential way, instead of transporting everything all together, you first look at the causal structure, the confounders, the mediators, the outcome, and then do it in order, you will not break the causal structure, okay? And that is, that is somehow the key takeaway, and here we formally, formally state that this actually, actually works, and the, the direct, indirect, and spurious effects are minimized, and they will be equals to zero if you're using the, what we call the causal IF procedure. Um, good, so that's the... That's the conclusion of, 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 of task two, I guess, to a large extent. And now, now and this is, I think, uh, part of the work that we are very excited about, is uh, how do we move beyond the SFM? And so far, we're working with this clustered model, right? So we are only distinguishing between confounders and mediators. Can we do more, right? And as we said, we, 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 have this, we have this graph, which is, which is relatively general, and we have these possibilities. We're computing measures of direct, indirect, and spurious effects, but what we're doing is we have a... Is there a absolutely, so the, the we're, uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. So we're computing direct, indirect, and spurious effects, and we have these options for the business necessity set. Okay, and we have this causal IF method for, for correction. So the reason why we have done this in the first place is that it is much, much easier to get the SFM than the full causal diagram, okay? So there is some gen genuine, genuine benefit in simplicity of these methods, and it allows you to get the first uh, iteration and to get a pretty good feeling for what's going on when you distinguish between direct, indirect, and spurious, right? So this is important. So that is, that is why we have chosen to work under the SFM. And one, one limitation, that doesn't have to be limitation in practice, but it could be limitation in practice is the business necessity sets that are allowed. So because this graph is somehow clustered, we can only choose the business necessity sets, which are the empty set, the set of the confounders, the set of the mediators, or both, right? So these are the possibilities for the business necessity set. And if you are if you're, if you're want to do, uh, if you want to test for disparate impact in, in a very general setting, you might say, oh, look, I have an example in which two of the mediators that I have should be in business necessity, but two of the mediators that I have should not be in business necessity. So somehow you believe some of the indirect pathways are okay and you believe some are not. And this leads to the, this leads to us to, to consider uh, performing a similar type of analysis, but under, under a, a more refined, a more pixelated, if you will, right? And what this entails is instead of the SFM, the clustered causal diagram, we want to see the, the, the complete causal diagram, which, is, uh, which, has, which fully specifies the causal relations between all the variables in some sense, right? So we, are not, we're, we have to 
we have to, for example, in this graph, we need to specify whether W1 uh, points towards W2 or W2 points to W1, right? So this is an important distinction for the, for the complete graph. But if you notice in the, in the SFM, we are, we are agnostic to this. The, the results are completely agnostic to, to the arrow between W1 and W2. And this, is a, this can be a major modeling advantage. But if you wish to make finer distinctions, you need to commit to more assumptions. This is somehow the feeling. And once we have done that, uh, we, can, we, will, we will be able to, to do not just direct, indirect, and spurious. We will be able to do variable-specific measures. So for every variable, so you have the TV, the overall disparity that you observed, you can attribute the disparity uh, measured by the TV to each of the variables in the data set, in the indirect and the spurious and the direct. And what you can do, your business necessity set can be any subset of the observables which can be desirable. If you have a specific application in mind in, where, in which the SFM is somehow too coarse to, to, to solve the problem, you need to, go, you need to go one level deeper. You need to zoom in on the, on the causal diagram. And I just want to mention uh, the last point. For, for fair prediction in this, in this more general context, we, ha we have the analog of causal IF, which is something that I have worked uh, with, uh, with Nikolai Mainzhausen at ETH Zurich, in which we do some kind of sequential optimal transport, but we do do it on the, on, the, on the full causal graph. And we are correcting for the indirect and direct effects, and we are allowing for business necessity. What Nikolai and I have not addressed and what we're trying to do now is, is, is how to deal with the spurious in this case, which is very important as well. And this fair adapt paper is, uh, appeared in JMLR in 2020, just uh, as a reference. And uh, that is, so this is in section six, which is not complete in the, in the technical report that we have done, but is coming in the, but is gonna be uh, published in the, in the coming weeks. And this is, uh, yeah, to be, uh, to, be, to be discussed further. Three minutes, perfect, perfect. I just want to conclude, this is my last slide. And I wanna, wanna say broadly what we have done today and what we've discussed. Uh, so as Elias pointed out and uh, Scott, Scottus, so the Supreme Court of the United States uh, repeatedly mentions as well, uh, any kind of legal considerations are inherently related to, to causal claims, right? And if you want to make causal claims, we believe that causal inference is, is a good, good tool uh, to support these claims. And Indispensable, yeah, true. In, indispensable, yeah, I agree, is, is, a, is a better word here. And to this end, to actually allow people to use these tools, we have introduced the, an entire framework for fairness analysis, uh, which is based on, uh, on causal inference. And what we have done in particular, we have, we have shown, uh, we have introduced some of these axioms, right, and formulated this fundamental problem of causality, which consists of decomposability, admissibility, and power, and showed how this allows us to attribute uh, the variations to different causal mechanisms, which in turn makes it easier for the legal doctrines to be mapped on, on, this, on this whole system. So this is the first, first key step that we have, we have done. And uh, then we... Also, as, as I said, develop the foundations of, of causal fairness analysis, and we have shown how causal fairness analysis can be used in practice. Okay, so we, we have taken these axioms, this abstract machinery that, is, uh, that might be theoretically nice, but maybe, maybe abstract for, for the practitioner, and we have also shown how this can be, uh, be done in practice. And here I mean specifically the fairness cookbook result, which somehow formalizes how to evaluate the legal doctrines, and I also mean the causal IF approach or the fair data adaptation approach. And uh, we honestly hope that uh, this type of effort can help all of us together to uh, design a, a new generation of AI systems which are more fair, more accountable, and more transparent, because uh, you probably know that these systems have a very big effect. And the data that we are working with is biased. And we need to, we need to make sure that these systems are OK. And with this, I would like to thank you and conclude the tutorial and just put the references in the end of all the work that motivated us and helped our thinking. And that's all. Thank you very much. Clarification. Does TV equal to zero? Yes. So to the issue is that we can find that direct, uh, direct uh, effect or indirect effect or AC effect is zero? No, so no. Effect? There's no implication. So, yeah, yeah, there's no implication here actually because if you think about the TV, it's actually uh, it's actually a sum of these three things, and all three can be non-zero, and when you add them up, you can get zero. 
So there's no, not even a single one uh, needs to be zero. And the opposite direction is also not true. W what do you mean by opposite direction? If, let's say, direct effect is zero, indirect effect is zero, and SE is zero, does it imply? No, that does imply. The opposite direction is actually okay. So, because when you add them up, so TV is just the sum of three components. If the components are zero, you can say the TV is zero, but not the other way around, right? So this is specific for a given structural model. Uh, yes, but I would be very interested if you have a, a fairness example that does not fit this this model, because th this is like these clusters are very general actually, and all of the everything that we've encountered so far actually falls under under the scope of this. Yeah. Thanks. Yes. Yeah. So in the fairness literature, there are results that calibration and error rates are not compatible. Yes. Do you think there is an interpretation of that in terms of Direct effects or uh, separating out why error rates are different compared to calculus. Um, that's a good question. I think this is this is not not a trivial one to answer, and maybe maybe we do it more offline. But uh, the there is definitely impossibility between these notions, as you say. And what what I what we would say is that even if you even if you say, oh, I'm not that interested in the TV that we talked about, you can repeat a lot of this exercise for the quality of odds, for example. Calibration is a different story. Calibration is, is more elusive. But I think there's 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 a huge debate you, underlying all of this. In some sense, you all get much more into yeah. the, 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 the yeah. about the EO. calibration. And yes, are, calibration. Calibration, is there's some discussion. But EO is not exactly the same. gets yeah. much more involved, but yes. the philosophy is the same. The yeah. mathematics will get yeah. more involved. A lot of the logic stays similar, but uh, mathematics, yeah, the expressions become more this complex. Is, uh, in, if you are interested in EO, there is a, then we have two examples. The EO in the TV is our paper in Neurips 18. Is the EO more complicated version? version yeah. 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 Thank you for the excellent tutorial. Um, I wanted to ask about the decomposition uh, yes. in different components. So, um, from what I remember in the original mediation formula, it's not really an additive decomposition. Right, there's sort of this split uh, uh, in the treatment as well. Yes. Um, so how could comment a bit more? Absolutely, absolutely. I uh, this is this is a very very good technical question, and I'm happy to discuss more online. The brief answer would be the following. So you're correct. So in the direct effect, you have a transition from x zero to x one, which from which you subtract the reverse transition. And if you look at the paper and what we actually propose, and there has been some uh, some recent thinking about this in the context of Shapley values, what we propose is to, uh, to so basically you can do it in two ways, right? So for the DE, you can take the transition X0 to X1, and they then take the reverse for the NIE, but what is possible as well, to take the X1 to X0 trans transition for the DE. And what we're proposing in the paper actually is to use the sum of these two and use the average of these two decompositions, which allows for some kind of symmetry and is aligned with the Shapley axioms, if that makes sense. I, I can elaborate on this technical point, but in the manuscript, we proposed something slightly more involved, but for the tutorial, it was very difficult to get to, to this, but it's a, very, it's a very good point. It's a very good point. Uh, so in the top of the work, do we transcribe the, the case for the edge or the edge? So, are you talking about the spurious part of the model, or? Yes. The yes. Yes. I. I. We. We think if you if you look at the real data, this happens quite a lot. If you like redlining is an excellent example, right? So location of living is is highly correlated with uh, with race, and if you if you if you look at. Uh, if there, there's religious segregation examples in, in different countries, right? Where your location, right, which is uh, protected, which is something in the, which is a confounder. And if you think about, would you say that the, the location is causally influenced by the gender or, or by race? Definitely not, right? And does, does your location, or your place of birth, does it cause your race? No, not really, right? So neither of the directed arrows in this case would be appropriate, but there is some association. And it's really, if you think about it, it's some kind of historical context that some groups have uh, located in, 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 different, in different, um, different zip codes in some sense. My question here is, uh, in the general framework, we have X, C, W, and Z. Yes. Yes. So do we assume that we have some other attributes that are the parents of the X, but not a part of Z. 
I don't think we, uh, I, I think it's, I think we handled this, right? My, my impression is for that question is that there's no issue. If, if X is the protected attribute from what I understand, we can, we, we can discuss offline, but my interpretation is there's no issue with what you've described, yeah. No issue, yeah. Yeah, cool. I, I think we have to conclude uh, and uh, thank you very much for attending, yeah. Thanks.